Okay, welcome back everyone to the Athletes Mind podcast. Very excited for this one. Um, Today, we're joined by the one and only Andy Donaldson, a very accomplished man, record breaker, open water swimmer, marathon swimmer, um, who, you know, you've had some amazing experiences and stories that, you know, we're going to dive into today um, with your whole swimming journey. So, um, yeah, Andy, thank you for coming on. How are you today? Yeah, very good. Thanks, Tony. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me in. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to interview you. Um, so, yeah, we'll get straight into it. So, the first thing that we like to ask our athletes, just a bit of backstory, like how did you f- initially find that passion for swimming and get into all the things you have done now? Was it from a young age or was it later on? Yeah, it was It was from a young age, um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm, yeah. I'm not from here in Australia originally. Uh, I grew up in the west coast of, of Scotland and um, really it was, it was following my older sister, my older cousin into the sport. Uh, I grew up in a quite active family you know we were always doing things uh, on holiday like you know hiking or down the beach and you know my sister my cousin they were competitive swimmers uh, pool swimmers I'll, I'll just add there mm. um, yeah many people were swimming open water yeah yeah back over there because uh, you know it's it's pretty cold <laughs> yeah of course of course yeah. and so I, I followed in their footsteps and and, and came through the the system over there mm. and were there any other um sports that you tried out throughout your life or has it just always been swimming yeah i mean um we we were as kids you know um, my parents encouraged us to do to do everything you know i was i was golfing or cycling a lot um, badminton was good at that mm. but um, it was really swimming that, that, that caught my passion yeah. um, from, a, from a young age mm. and I think it was only um, as I got into my teens and I started performing and, and racing at a national level and, and started winning medals at a national yeah. level that um, I started to focus more of my attention there and, and the yeah. other things kind of uh, were, were put to us, uh, put put aside, I suppose, mm. to focus on on the on the swimming. Yeah, so that's sort of when you realise you could go somewhere with it when you start winning those medals. In yeah, the that, that's it. So I I remember winning my first um, national age medal at the age of eleven, mm. um, racing guys in the in the year group above me. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I was geez. quite I was quite a small guy. Um, I I wasn't built like these other boys who. You know, were a year older and had mustaches and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 I get what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> but but one thing that I had uh, that I did have um, that I'm I'm very grateful for was that my coach is really uh, focused on technique. Mm-hmm. Uh, so from a young age, you know, they were always about getting the the technique and the stroke right before anything else because get the foundations right and yeah. you know later in life when you when you grow and 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 gain muscle you know then yeah. it just amplifies what you've already been practicing so mm. uh, that was a real focus from a young age and and i'm glad that that was the case yeah 100 percent. and you are originally from uh scotland is that correct yeah mm-hmm. so um you moved to perth in 2013 and uh outside of just swimming like how did you actually find the move to perth uh, well, it, it was an interesting one. Um, so, uh, I, again, I'll, I'll take a bit of a step back because I moved to Perth in 2013 and it had always been a dream of mine to race for Scotland. You know, mm. I'd grown up, um, you know, training, going to school and then training again every day. And this had been, you know, this lifelong dream of mine. And to, to take people back... In 2014, the the perfect, almost the perfect opportunity arose with um, the Commonwealth Games going to be held in Glasgow. So yeah, Glasgow being the, yeah. the biggest city in Scotland. So it was at a home games and, and really this was like this opportunity of a lifetime and I was, you know, desperate to, to do anything I could to, to um, make the team. So I'd just finished university in 2012 and I thought to myself, you know, I want to give myself the best chance possible to to make that team. So I I ended up moving myself, you know, halfway across the world to yeah. to swim amongst some of the best swimmers um, globally. You know, the Australian it's uh, swimming in Australia. You know, it's it's really ingrained into the culture here, and we've yeah. got some of the best swimmers in the world around. So. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And yeah, so so you made that move solely for swimming, predominantly yeah. for swimming. I mean, I, I think also. Um, 
being 21 at the time, I, I wanted to see yeah. other parts of the world and, and so forth. But predominantly, yeah, I came across um, purely for, for swimming purposes. Mm. Yeah. And you did mention the Commonwealth Games. We will touch on a bit of that later. But um, at the moment, you were trying to beat the record for the Ocean 7. Mm. Um, so can you sort of just explain to us and, you know, some of the listeners who maybe aren't familiar with what the Ocean 7 actually is? Yeah. So the, the, the Ocean 7 um, is it's, it's open water. So you, you're racing out in, in the oceans. And it's a collection of the world's seven toughest channel swims. Mm. So these are swims that are marathon in distance, so that means they're over 10 kilometers, yep. and they're spread around the globe. So they're in you know, all sorts of places like uh, Hawaii, Japan, Spain, all the way through to maybe less tropical places like Scotland. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's- <laughs> um, and there's, there's some really well-known ones like the English Channel. That's, mm. that's probably the most famous channel swim in the world. Yeah. Um, so this collection of seven swims uh, they're considered to be the most iconic the toughest and you know they, they present their own unique challenges yeah um you know talking about the swim in scotland like the water there is is freezing so that's really yeah. tough versus yeah. somewhere like hawaii where it is a bit more tropical but you have you know, you're right in the middle of the Pacific and there's these rolling swells that come through that are really challenging yeah. to, to deal with. So it's a great, um, it's a fantastic challenge. It's, it's probably the sort of, um, it's, it's like the swimming equivalent of something like the Summit 7 where, mm. where you've got the seven highest um, and most challenging peaks in the world. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a challenge that I've taken on in the last, um, 12 months um, with the purpose of I've been trying to do it within a year to raise money for mental health mm. yeah we, we will talk about that, um, mm. mental health as well later on which I think is awesome but uh, the next stop for you is um, correct me if I'm wrong on this but Spain to Africa yes is that channel yeah, yeah. Um, which I'm pretty sure it's the shortest out of the seven it is the shortest um, yeah. still, and I'm thankful for that <laughs> yeah still she's like you know some crazy stuff 14, 14 kilometers roughly I think yes um, I understand the training and preparation is like you know quite intense um, what are you sort of doing like leading up to this next channel um, I understand you leave this Wednesday mm-hmm. um, what's the training been like so far the training it's um, it is it's, it's like almost having um, another job mm. um, you know there's there's no getting around it we you can't really take any shortcuts you have to do the distance and get the mileage in yep. um, so I'm, I'm training at the moment sort of uh, twice a day in the pool, uh, two hours each, Jeez. Um, and then every now and again putting some gym work in there as well, just mm. making sure that the muscles and the ligaments are sort of uh, durable and um, able to withstand the the sort of I suppose beating that they'll be receiving when it comes to to swimming across one of these channels. Yeah, oh, but geez, I can imagine like it would be very intense with all the training you're doing and you know preparing for such an amazing event. Um, talking more onto the mental side, obviously something that we discuss heavily here on mm. the athlete's mind. Um, being an open water swimmer, you know you're out there. Like, obviously, you have your, your team, um, but you're you're out there alone. You know, especially like mentally. Um, is it does it get lonely like swimming in those events and like what sort of goes through your head doing those large amount of um, kilometers in swimming? I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And I suppose from face value, you look at something like marathon swimming or open water swimming as being a solo sport or something that's quite lonely. I mean, what tends to happen, you've got the swimmer there and they've got a support boat that will go along beside them or mm. a kayaker. So if you take, for example, the Rottnest Channel Swim, you've got all three of those. But... It can be, you know, when you're out there, it it can be quite isolating. You're you're not chatting to anyone. It's not like a game of footy where, you know, you're communicating with your teammates or anything, all that much. Um, And, you know, if you stop and and do that in some circumstances, you know, if take, for example, the English Channel, if you stop for anything more than 10 seconds, it's quite likely that the, the currents and tides will actually actually pushed you yeah, yeah, yeah. off course. Um, but I would say that it's, it's, it's not a solo sport at all. Uh, I mm. think it's, I think 
that would be the first thing that I'd say to anyone getting into the sport. Like, you're not really there alone and you can't do it by yourself. You know, you've got, on the day, you know, you've got your skipper and ultimately you're following him. He's setting the course and, and you you know, you're following the path that they choose. You've got the guys on the boat there, you know, supporting you. They're, they're there every stroke of the way. Um, and then if you, you know, take a step back, in the lead up to these swims, you know, you've got your coach, they're training you every day, all your teammates, um, the wider team, you know, like guys like your nutritionist or, or your masseuse or your sports chiro. So it's, it's, it's not really something that, the way I see it, it's not really something that you, you can really tackle on your own. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in those days that you're training and, and you are fatigued and, and maybe having some self-doubts, it is so much. It is so important to have these people on that journey with you because yeah. they're probably the ones that are going to help you get through those toughest times and, and provide that encouragement for you to to, to keep pushing forward through yeah. the adversity. Definitely, I, I think the only way I can sort of relate to that personally is um, with boxing. Like mm. boxing's, a, you know, you're in the ring alone, um, and same with swimming. You know, you're out there alone, but like you said perfectly it's your team at yeah. the end of the day like they they're there to support you and you know you if you need to talk to them they're there so i think that's awesome um mm-hmm. something which you you did mention earlier is um mental health at the moment which you are um you know raising money for um something that i find very amazing is uh the black dog I- institute um so can you maybe just talk to us a bit about that what it's all about and what it is you're actually doing to help the cause yeah well uh, i i suppose i, I should probably explain how I, I got into this uh, because I I'll take a bit of a step back earlier I mentioned about about the Commonwealth Games and unfortunately I I busted my shoulder before yeah, yep. before the qualifying event for that and it actually derailed all my preparation and I, I ended up not making the team mm. and so I had this lifelong goal of, of racing at the Commonwealth Games I was sidelined, having to watch from the other side of the world whilst all of my friends, mm. people I'd grown up with, um, had uh, you know made the team and, and were essentially realising the stream of mine. And so in that moment, I, I did pivot and I, I got it. I, I started doing open water, but as although I was good at it, there, there weren't those opportunities to, to race at an international stage. So... I ended up quitting swimming back in 2016. Yeah. Funnily enough, in 2020, during the coronavirus pandemic, I actually found myself back in the water. And it wasn't it wasn't to, to train or to race or anything, but it was more for this mental well-being uh, sort of management tool, mm. uh, having sport and having something to do during lockdown and, and a way to see my friends and... and engaging community and I think off the back of that I realized that a I needed swimming in my life again Mm. not just for the mental well-being but for the physical benefits as well and access to community Um, and I was just really enjoying it and realized the importance of it and from there it was you know any swimming that I did I I went on to to race Rottnest which um, if you want we can we can chat about that but Mm. I wanted it, like, mental health had been something that was an important cause in, in my life. That there's been people I've known that have mm. had their struggles, um, including myself, uh, and I've lost friends to suicide. And mm. you know, with swimming being this incredible tool for managing my own mental well-being, it, it was it, it just seemed to fit quite well that any swims that I did, that was the cause that I wanted to to support, and so when the time did come to do the Ocean 7 and start on that journey, mental health was what I wanted to support. Mm. And I was looking at different charities and the sort of work that they were doing. And it kept coming back to the Black Dog Institute. Yeah. You know, with with the way that mental health is, you know, it's it's such a pertinent issue in our time. I think it's some something quite big, like one in every five Australians. Yeah suffers from some mental illness during any given year Mm. and so what the black dog institute do is 
you know, they're they're researching mental illness across the lifespan. So like not just teenagers, but like right up to older people as well. And they're trying to better understand, you know, the the issue, how to both and how to both treat and, and prevent illnesses. And I just thought, you know, that's that's the perfect thing. And that mm-hmm. provides the foundation for all these incredible services and other charities to use their empirical work to, to provide their mm. their sort of um, their services that can help people. Yeah, and, and that's honestly, that's a massive respect to you, like, you know, trying to advocate that through what you're doing. That's actually really inspiring, especially for, you know, other athletes. I think, because like you said, mental health, especially in this generation, I think it's, it's a big issue, 100%. I think even with the, um, you know, social media being a big thing, it can sometimes affect yeah, mental health absolutely. as well. But um, yeah, like going back to, you know, your personal experience with it, would you say that like, you know, the swimming really kept you in a really good mental space doing it and the community as well? Like being able to have those people around you just made your whole quality of life better? Oh, uh, without a doubt, yeah. you know, I... <laughs> I was a bit, I suppose I was going through a stage where I was quite lost in life. Um, I'd, I'd quit my job in 2019. I'd gone overseas to travel and I suppose the, the old find yourself, you know, overseas. But I wasn't really doing that. I was just kind of drinking and partying. And yeah. when, when COVID happened, I came back to Perth and the swimming provided some structure mm. to things. You know, it provided a routine. I would get up in the morning, I'd... I'd go for a swim. I was, you know, getting my, my hit of endorphins um, through exercise and, and meeting up with friends, having catch-ups, having coffees. Mm. And, yes, it's these little things that you don't realise have such an impact on yeah. on your life and, and on your well-being. And so, you know, I think whether it's swimming, whether it's any kind of sport or some kind of endeavour, that, that provides that access to community, I, I think it's so important mm. for that we take the time to, to go and do them. 100%. Okay. Personally, I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. And I think, you know, as bad as it was the time during COVID, I think it was a wake up call for a lot of mm. people um, during that period. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, something that I ju- we just want to uh, move on to quickly. We this is something new that we've done. It's a bit of quick fire questions. Yeah, so go ahead. just going off from the uh, <laughs> swimming and mental side. Yeah, do it. It's just five quick questions. Just we want to get a bit to know you. Obviously, you're yeah, here no, on the I'll podcast. So so just answer as quick. Uh, yeah, obviously, if you need to think about it, that's fine. There's no rush. <laughs> but um, yeah, just five questions just about you, just yeah. random. So we'll start with number one. What is your favorite animal? Favorite animal? Uh, dog. Dog. Yeah. And number two, favourite song or musician? <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is where I probably lose audiences. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's all right. <laughs> I, oh, look, I'd say um, the, the answer I would normally give is Dire Straits. It's, yeah. um, you know, um, an 80s band, listen to them in the car. My dad would put it on, but Secret secret sort of guilty pleasure would be Justin Timberlake <laughs> oh yeah alright nice Justin Timberlake um, can't be a bit the JT yeah of course <laughs> um, number three what is your favourite food go to food top of the chart for top you. of food ah fo- oh, jeez it'd be a tie is that really yeah, yeah, yeah go on go on um, tell us both fish and chips yeah alright and a plate of haggis Nice, all yeah, right. I love a good bit of like that. Can't go wrong with it. Um, number four, do you prefer summer or winter? Summer. Summer, yep. Uh, Being a swimmer, of well, course. <laughs> one of the reasons for moving here. Yeah. <laughs> Escape the weather back in school. Yeah. And just for the last one, what is your favourite sport outside of swimming? Ooh. Probably soccer. Soccer? Yeah, yeah, yeah nice, I nice. I like a bit of soccer. Respect that. Yeah, yeah, so that's quick fire questions. I can't, um, I can't play it, but I like, yeah, no, I like, like, I like watching. watching it. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's completely fine. Um, yeah, so that was a quick fire question. That, that's something new that we've recently yeah, done. I like so, it. Yeah. yeah, good good answers. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but back to, um, you know, yourself and your achievements. And you did talk a bit about this before is, um, you know, after you took that break from swimming is like when you actually discovered the open water. I just want to sort of ask, like, how was the – move from pool swimming to open water was it like because obviously i believe you were really into your 200 meter um freestyle freestyle and then going on to you know tens of k's marathons like how was the switch between that yeah well um 
Well, I'll, I'll, I'll come out the bat saying, you know, it wasn't an instant transformation. Mm. It, it was it was brutal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, if we, we I, I kind of briefly touched on it earlier. Like, after the Commonwealth Games, I I was sitting down with my coach and I, I said to him, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit lost at what do I do. You know, I'm a bit at, at a crossroads. Do I stick at the sport? Do I try the 200 freestyle again? Or do I try something different? And we ended up together making the decision to go into open water. Mm. And so in open water, there is the five kilometer event, the 10 kilometer event, the 25K, and then there's all these channel swims around the world. And so the 10K is what they do at the Olympic Games and and most of the international races are 10Ks. So that's what I started training for. So this is back 2014, 2015. And so I gave it a I gave it a real good go at the beginning, and you know I was fortunate. I had real good teammates who were already already racing internationally. Uh, a guy called Simon Hootinga, he was on the Australia team. Heidi Gan was racing for Malaysia, so I had these fantastic people to learn from um, around me. And you know, in the beginning, you know, I, I jumped into their lane, and the the it, like the first thing was that the, the distance is covered in the sessions. Mm. Just, yeah, just was, shot up um, you know they, they would go from 6 kilometers up geez, to yeah. 8 kilometers in a 2 hour session so that's yeah, yeah. it's quite a long way like that's almost halfway to Rottnest yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, a, in a session and then you would do that again in the evening so you'd pretty much have covered a distance a swim to Rottnest in a day and yeah. doing that every day apart from a Sunday so mm-hmm. it was big mileage and um, you know I did that for for just over a year before um giving away the sport in 2016 because I didn't really feel there were the opportunities available to race on the international stage. You know, GB had their guys selected um, for the for the foreseeable future. Australia, I didn't have a passport there for the, mm. uh, at the time. So um, I moved away this, from the sport. But when I returned to open water swimming, in, uh, swimming and then open water swimming in 2020, I still had this experience to draw from. So it was... Mm. It was quite fortunate I wasn't coming in brand new um, to open water uh, when I did get back into the sport during during the coronavirus lockdown. Mm. Yeah. And going on to like the actual marathon itself, like, you know, swimming in those conditions can be very tough. Like, you know, you mentioned before the temperature of the water can get cold, strong winds and, you know, even like shark infested waters. Mm. Um, does that like not scare you? Like when you're doing <laughs> these swims? Like, Absolutely. I mean... Yeah, it's it's a it's a huge difference between you know pool swimming and and open water. You know, you're out there. There's no black line to follow. Um, you're exposed to all the elements: so wind, currents, swell, water temperatures. There's all the marine life, as mm-hmm. as you mentioned, um, and it does. Look, it, it plays on your mind. Um, when I was over. In New Zealand, swimming the Cook Strait, for example, yeah, the- um, we we set off at midnight. Yeah, yeah, for and the so, conditions. You know yep. that that's when the conditions were were forecasted to be best. That was the only window within a month of waiting yeah. for the swim and waiting for the right conditions um, that presented itself. And yeah. so you're at the mercy of of Mother Nature, really. And, mm. and there's a lot of things without out with of your control that you know, are daunting, but it's it's part and parcel of of this sport that you you kind of have to become comfortable with that mm. and and make the most of whatever you're given. Yeah, that that's what makes the sport so amazing. I think because there's so many things you just can't control. Mm. So it's like yeah, it's like a leap of faith almost. Yeah. Um, and talking about you know your diet, that's something that um I, I'm quite interested in that I want to <laughs> sort of know. Like what's what's the what are you sort of um, eating at the moment to maintain a healthy diet? And also on top of that, when you're out doing the event, like, is it, do you lose a lot of calories? Like, obviously you would, but ha- just talk to us a little bit about that. Sort yeah, of so I think you, you can split it up into two things, um, you know, the day-to-day stuff and then when, when you're actually doing one of these yeah. um, ch- uh, channel swims. So like the day-to-day, I think it's, I think it's like most sports, you, you, you know, you, you've got to eat healthy what you put in um you are what you eat you know the mm-hmm. um 
when it comes to to day to day training, you, the nutrition plays such a big part because yes, it's it's great if you can you know hammer it out in one session and and train like a beast, but if you're absolutely you know buggered for the rest of the week, then you know it's, it's, you're not really getting any benefits. So the nutrition plays a big part of that in in day to day recovery. And I think when it become when it comes to performance sport, it's it's not how hard you can go in just the one session, but it's how hard you can go over a period of time and bounce back and keep mm. maintaining that performance. That's where the development and the growth comes. Um, and nutrition plays a big part of that. When it comes to the actual swims, um, I suppose uh, you know the easiest comparison, like if you think of a marathon run. Or like city to surf, or, or one of these yeah. kind of events. Like you've always got these water stations and people taking on fluids, mm. you know, throughout the the race. And I suppose it's the same out there. You've, you've got you're swimming along. You've got the boat there, and the guys are, are preparing sort of nutrition to to give you every twenty minutes, for example. Mm. And and for me, everyone's everyone's kind of like, it's called a feed plan. Um, everyone's feed plan is kind of unique and, and specific to them but for me you know I, I'm taking on maybe 200 milliliters of, of fluids mm. um, I'm f- strictly fluids only uh, I don't want anything kind of clogging me up I don't want to be chewing or yeah, you yeah. know eating a muffin or whatever <laughs> <laughs> uh, so fluids only it passes through the gut easier and aiming at sort of 36 carbs um per feed so that's like 100 uh, grams of carbs per hour and the idea is that you should have done like a a carb load in the week leading up to the swim that kind of sets you up for the first half and then the feeds and and the fluids and the drinks that you're taking on during the swim kind of set you up for the second half yeah geez um and what what about recovery like i'm I'm sure recoveries must be like for you know, any elite athlete, it's very taken very seriously. Like, what do you sort of do to recover and make sure you're in good shape? In day to day training or after one of these swims? On a, yeah, day to day training. Day to day. I think, yeah, uh, you know, getting some food into you straight, like as soon as you can uh, after the training session, like, I think that's so important. Um, you know, I live five minutes away from the swimming pool that I live at, uh, mm-hmm. that I train at, BT Park. So, yeah, BT Park. you know, I, I usually go home and I've already got my meal ready. Yeah. I can just heat it up in the microwave. It's, yeah. It's quite handy. Nice. So, you know, that sleeping well mm-hmm. um, and, and, you know, as I'm getting older, uh, I'm 32 now, you know, looking after my body, making sure that. I do my stretching and, yeah. and go see the masseuse or the sports chiro and, and mm. just making sure that any of those um, niggles don't develop into into anything more yeah. more serious that could you know hamper my training and yeah. and affect things in the long run. Very important. Um, we're almost getting to the end. We did get some questions sent in, which um, we'll just go through now. Um, mm. So the first one we've got is from Maddock. Um, and his question was, will you be doing the Rotto solo again or the 25 kilometer PTP ultra marathon? Um, <laughs> I've, I've already done the Rotness solo um, before. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to win it in 2021. So for me, that that's something I'm quite content with. And, and you know, I had an incredible journey back into the water and, 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 you know, having the fortune uh, to, to go on and, and have such an excellent swim there. So I feel that that chapter's, I'm quite content with that and I feel that that chapter's closed. Uh, the Port to Pub 25, I do think is something I would love to, to have a crack at. Um, so maybe when the Ocean 7 is complete, mm. I've got a bit of a freer sk- uh, schedule that I can turn my attention and, and maybe yeah. focus and, and have that. Uh, as a goal 100% uh, this next one from Max Cotton uh, <laughs> yeah when is he going to start his campaign to be on The Bachelor <laughs> <laughs> Jesus 
<laughs> Funny one. <laughs> well, um, Ma- Max Cotton, I don't know if you know, he's the he's the winner of the Port to Pub from this year. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez, oh, yeah. did not know that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, um, I actually spoke to Max on the phone today, so mm. he never mentioned that he was going to put something in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, okay, I mean, uh, at the moment, you know, trying to, so I'm trying to do all these all seven of these swims within the space of a year. Um, it's it's been quite a challenge, and yeah. certainly it's, it's it's kind of taking over a lot of my time. Um, but you know, it's, at the same time, it's something I I really enjoy doing. So, 100%. Um, I think for now that's the focus, and maybe maybe after it's done, I can explore. Uh, In the near the, future, yeah, <laughs> dating world and. and um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> love life again. <laughs> of course. Um, next one from Robin Lang. How are you funding the swims at the moment? At the moment, so at the moment it's self-funded. Um, yep. The Ocean Seven. It's. I mean, for anyone that has done something like Rotnest, you know, it's it's quite um, logistically. There's a lot of planning that get that, that's involved in it. Um, and you know it is quite an expensive thing to do now think of that and picture it overseas in a country that you might never have been to with people that you don't know um, and the amount of work involved to get something like that set up mm. multiplied by seven Yeah, you know, it's, it, it is quite a logistical challenge and it is an expensive and costly process to, to kind of go down it yeah um, so right now, you know, I, I started this journey, uh, it would have been August last year with the English Channel. Um, my kind of, I wanted to get this thing started. Um, and instead of trying to write to, because I, I wanted to try get some backing and sponsorship, but mm. I also wanted to try get some results under my belt first before writing to all these potential sponsors and, and people asking for support because I think that's very easy to do, you know, asking for for backing and financing when it's just an idea, but to actually go and do it and have some skin in the game and show the initiative to get out there, do some swims, pay for it yourself, I, I think that's different. And that's what I've done so far. You know, I'm, I'm four swims into this challenge. It's all been self-funded. Um, there's no financial backers, so you know that's that's where things are at. And I am trying to to get people on board and and to write reach out to people and see if this is what they like, something that they think is good and yeah, um, they like what we're doing. But unfortunately, I think it's just a very tough environment out there. Yeah, you know, we we have been trying to reach out to to all these different people, but no one's come forward to. Um, support things and look if that's how it is we'll, we'll find a way to keep going and yeah. um, and, and get to the end because I, I really believe in what we're doing yeah. and I think there could be great outcomes for, for mental health and helping great charities like the, the Black Dog Institute most definitely and yeah you know I think you have to make sacrifices 100%, yeah. 100%. Um, last question here from Nicholas Siciliano what is going through your head when you're about to dive off the block in a race, obviously that would be going back to your 200 meter freestyle, mm, that sort mm. of stuff. I think when it comes to that, I think what I would say is in those moments, I don't think you're really thinking. Mm. And what I mean by that, I think you're already in autopilot in hopefully you should have practiced and, and prepared enough so that you don't have to be thinking in those situations. Mm-hmm. So if I if I use Rotnest for an example, before I rock up on, on the start line, you know, I've 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 been speaking to a lot of people, I've been gathering information, I've created a, a plan um plan of attack for the day, like a race plan. You know, everyone knows their roles, everyone knows the plan inside out so my team my support team the skipper and so that it means on the morning or just before your race 
it means that you can just be there and, and be in the present. You know, mm. you're not worrying about all these different things. You're not thinking, all right, is where am I going to meet the skipper? Or yeah, um, you know, am I going to meet the, the kayaker at 500 meters or at 1k? Because it's all been agreed upon before, and you should know it behind, like like the back of your hand. So when those moments come, it, it should be a matter of it's just auto, like mm. it comes automatically, and you yeah. can just kind of turn up and execute. Yeah, fair enough. Um, just one more question. You have been awesome today. Um, but yeah, just last one before we go. Um, what advice would you give to our listeners, you know, maybe young athletes or athletes that, um, you know, to overcome hard times and challenges they face in their sport? Mm. I think that's a fantastic question. Um, and, and I'd probably break that up into two things. So the first part, I think during the, the tough times, I think it's always good to, to think back to the why. Mm. You know, why are you doing this? Um, what is it that's motivating you? What's the purpose behind this? You know, are you enjoying it? Um, so uh, I suppose the easiest way to, to kind of explain that, um, say, for example, someone swimming to Rot Nest. If they're swimming to Rot Nest because their friends are doing it and you know they're not really that bothered they just want to get a photo at the end to to put on instagram or Mm. they want the number plates when that person experiences um you know the adversity and the tough times in the middle of that channel uh, is that a good enough reason to really push through like yeah is that worth warranting you know all the suffering that you might face in that like say it's a really bad day, like all that kind of hardship. And then I'll give you another example. What about if someone, someone's doing rot nest, no one's given them a hope of hell of, of making it, but their 11 year old son is looking up to them mm. and is saying, I really want you to do this. You know that that person's going to go through hell to make it to the end, 100%. and that's going to be you know their main motivator. They're going to think, all right, my, my son believes in me. I'm going to push through, and that's I mean they're obviously two ends of this uh, like two ends of the spectrum. But you know I think purpose is a real big thing. You know you see it all the time where you know uh, marathon runners are push through the the pain barriers because they're raising money for charity or. Mm. Olympic athletes, they, they've gone through a week of competing and then on the very last day, they've, they've got relay teams and they somehow managed to find extra energy to, to pull one out of the bag for the, for the boys or the, you know, the other guys in the team. Like, I think when you're doing something for something bigger than yourself, there's, there's more reason to, to push through those tough times and I think it's worth spending those moments to, to you know, draw on those motivations and, and the why. Mm. I think that's a great source of um, drive through the tough times. Yeah, the purpose. Yeah, fair enough. That's a very good answer. I think, you know, everyone listening right now and all the athletes out there can definitely take something mm. from that. You know, the why, their purpose, those are, you know, very important things to consider. And like you said, it pushes them when things get tough. So yeah. that's very good. Um yeah, that reaches us yeah. to, to the end. But um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's been yeah, it's been awesome. a great chat. Um, everyone listening, please go and follow Andy and support him. Um, obviously, with the Ocean Seven, uh, you leave and you, you're going to Spain this Wednesday. Um, all the best for that and the rest of the Ocean Seven. I'm sure you will go out and achieve awesome things. Thank so you. Yeah. thank you for coming on. No, I appreciate it, Tony. Yeah, there you are. all good. Um, yeah, everyone listening. This will be on YouTube, Spotify, or podcast platforms. Go and follow the Instagram, the TikTok. You guys know the drill. And yeah, we'll catch you guys in the next episode of The Athlete's Mind. Thank you.